Okay, well now we've seen the very formal way of saying what a limit is, it's this isomorphism, so remember, given a diagram of shape i, a limit for it is an object u together with a natural isomorphism from here to here. Now at this point, it, you probably think it, it makes sense to use some sensible notation here to show that what we've done is we've taken a di particular diagram and we've produced a limit for it. So we'll sometimes write the limit as, uh, well, we use this integral sign. So this is saying that we're taking the limit over all the objects in I of this functor. Uh, we sometimes also write lim, and then we write an arrow going backwards towards the category I and show that we're taking a limit of the functor D. Now, it's important to know which way around these go, because if you move this variable to the top, then that's a co-limit. And this also switches around when you do co-limits. So as far as I'm concerned, it's completely impossible to remember which one is which, but never mind. Um, something, something else to say is that we are, of course, interested in looking at all the possible limits of this shape i in a particular category. So we've seen that we can take products of any two objects in certain categories. And it's nice to be able to know that you can take the product of any two objects. It's kind of a bit annoying if you can take a product of these two objects, but you can't take a product of those two objects or these two objects. But if you can always take a product of two objects, then you say that this category has all binary products. And so we can also say that the category has all limits of shape i. If given any diagram of that shape in the category, you can always take a limit of it. Now, this isn't always true in all categories, of course. Sometimes you can't do that. But when it is true, it's great. And we say um, a category has all limits of shape i if it has a limit for every diagram of shape i. Now, if it does, then something rather nice happens here. If I just fill in, if I just fill in this object here, so instead of writing u, I'm going to write limb with this thing going backwards of D. Okay. So this formula might now remind you of something. It might, perhaps, I hope, remind you of the definition of an adjunction. If you think of this as something of D, and you think of this as something of V, then it looks an awful lot like, it looks like, It looks like we've got delta blank to show that you're going to fill in a V there. It looks an awful lot like that is adjoint, left adjoint to this. I'll put a blank there to show that's where we're putting the D. Now, is that true? Well, it turns out that it is true if we have all limits of that shape. We have to work out exactly what this means. So if you just think about this functor for a second, this functor takes a functor from I to C and it spews out for us some object of C, which is this limit vertex here. This functor starts with an object of C and it gives us back, where am I going to write this? I'll write it here. So on the other hand, delta blank starts in C and it gives us back a functor from I to C. So what it does is it takes an object V and it gives us the constant functor that sends everything to V. Um, and so, well, first we, there are several things we'd have to do to show this. First, we need to know that this is even a functor in the first place. That's quite a fun exercise. Um, then we have to show that this isomorphism is also natural in D. So far, we've got that it's natural in V. We also need it to be natural in D. Um, that's also quite fun. And then we can show that this, well, then it follows immediately from this, this definition that that really is an adjunction. So this is true, yes, if C has all limits of shape. And 
so this gives us a rather nice relationship between limits and adjunctions. And it's part of a whole categorical picture where everything is sort of really examples of everything else and it's all tied together in a nice little network. That's all I'm going to say now. <laughs>